We're finally here. We're finally at the end of August and at the end of the New Jedi Order series. The final book in the New Jedi Order series, The Unifying Force. The novel is set in the final year of the Yuuzhan War, begins in the Yuuzhan prisoner war camp on the planet Silverus, where Janet and named where Janet named Thross and three Bith memorized the code mathematically encrypted on a smuggler computer chip. Courtesy of the Rin Network, the four prisoners of escape are soon chased down by Yuuzhan security patrols. The chase kills two of the Bith, while the last one is recaptured. Thross, however, is saved by the crew of the Millennium Falcon and is taken back to the Galactic Alliance in order to give out the mathematical code. After the code is translated, they find out that the prisoners of Silvers are due to be publicly sacrificed on New Year's and Tar, which I must remind all of you that it's the captured Coruscant and the new planetary capital of the Yuuzhan Vong. The Silver System is also the rendezvous point for the Yuuzhan prisoner transport convoy, so the Galactic Alliance plans to save most, if not all, of the prisoners on the pl at the planet. The reason that the Galactic Alliance sees that saving the prisoners of this particular convoy is because the likes of Captain Gender Page and Major Past Kraken are needed to lead and rally other plans against the Yuuzhan Vong. Commander Malik Kars, Overseer of the prisoner of war camp fails to divulge the, this information from the captured Bith as he uses a, a tkun to strangle himself to death for the mathematical code in front of the other prisoners. Though the rescue attempt goes well despite battle erupting as a result, several prisoners are shipped up to using tar nonetheless. Meanwhile, the Millennium Falcon is greatly damaged in the conflict by specialized using long sis because, well, we gotta get that tension there, you know, that tension with Han Solo, like, oh, he's obviously gonna die, probably, maybe, not really. Coercing it to make a random hyperspace jump that places it in the Kalu system. Here, it turns out that the system inhabitants have been fending them for themselves off the have been fending themselves off from the Yuuzhan for several weeks since the disruption of their holonet, thanks to Yuuzhan adaptability in their biotechnology. Nonetheless, despite the fight, the crew aboard Kalu Orbital agrees to fix the Falcon up, and though Han and Leia Solo help out the space station's last stand against the Vong, they eventually escape to ship their load of free prisoners back to the Galactic Alliance, despite the fact some of them, such as Pass Kraken, have decided to stay behind in order to keep fighting the Vong. Later on, however, the Galactic Alliance finds out that Kal Kalu had willingly surrendered rendered in the fall of, the sp of its space station, but asked the Vong to allow scientists of the planet because of, the, of a neutral phenomenon called the Noct Nocturne of the Winged Stars, which occurs quite rarely on, on the world, Han and Leia, with several other accomplices, um, Melku, 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 Woro, and Kit Duran, and Gender Page, Gender Page, arrive at the planet disguised as scientists to meet up with the two other spies, Fur and Sasso, to help them kill Kalu's Yan Mosque which appears to prove crucial to the Yuuzhan plans in attacking the Galactic Alliance capital, Wodomong Calamari. In reality, this is merely a ploy for tactical purposes on the Yuuzhan behalf. The team members, however, are intercepted by specialized Yuuzhan Mong patrols, which both spies, with both spies killed, Han, Lei, and the others are captured and are taken back, taken to be executed at the, uh, at the Yan Mask, because, well... Han and Leia are clearly going to be executed, like, it, it's clearly obvious, like, it's obviously going to happen, like, if you read this now, you'd probably be saying, oh, that's obviously not going to happen. But the Yuuzhan Vong on planet, commanded by Commander Carr, along with the Yan Mask and all the rest of the artificially grown bots, mysteriously die off just as Lando Calrissian, Talon Crid, and Sh Shada Dukwa arrive to rescue Team Maluk. Kip Durant theorizes that the Vong on Kalu died because of the earlier development of the Alpha Rip pathogen on the world. Ron confirms this, saying that this was sent he was sent here to report on the Alpha Red's effectiveness. This explains why Kalu has seemingly surrendered in the first place. Han, Leia, and most others find this to be a potential galactic catastrophe because Alpha Red could even harm and or kill other life across the galaxy. Just as the indigenous life um, notably the winged stars on Kalu had suffered.
which also explains the hindering of the nocturne that had been noticed earlier. So let's see, you have a user involved crisis, and now you have a disease that could kill everything. Way to go! The situation is compounded by the fact that if they wipe out the user involved, then they will be committing genocide and act not beneath the volume themselves. It is all more unfortunate for them as the specialized user among ship ha on Kalu has made had made take off its crew fully aware of what they were harboring harboring I mean harbor harboring sorry. In order to report back to Yuzantar so that they can warn the elite high command of their pa their of the pathogen. The group of the, of the most emotionally weary of what will be done proceed to return to Galactic Lines just as the force of its military at Mount Calamari are in fighting the invading armada. The battles the battle sees Jane so losing her astromech droid Chappie and nearly getting killed as the rest of the Yuzenvong Armada nearly overwhelms the Galactic Lions defensive fleet. Elsewhere, the living planet Zoma Skeda is traveling through hyper via hyperspace for the Coruscant system since the events of the previous novel, the Final Prophecy, the character is taking refuge in the planet's caves and other safety features. Jedi Master Luke Skywalker, Mar Jade, Jason Solo, Corrin Han, Talia Vila, Telex, Saban, Saban, whatever, Force Sensitive Scientist Donald Kui, and the Astromech Droid R2D2 because he's been alive this whole time, recover the use of our priest Hanar, who, fought, who was thought dead in his confrontation with the treacherous Nomenar back in the previous novel. Since then, Hanar has lost faith in his religion after. After discovering the connection between his species and the living planet, since um, this was originally discovered by the late Volume Master Shaper Nim Yin, who was killed by Nam in order to prevent her from stopping him from trying to, mal to malfunction Zoma's hyperdrive cores and subsequently killing it in the process. The latter had failed, obviously. Um, Skidda comes to recognize Hanar by his species via the encounter that they had with the Vong a few decades earlier. Because of Skid's recognition of the Vong, it explains to the characters, though through its possession of Mas uh, Magus Magister Jebetha Hal, that the original Yuzantar back in the Yuzamong's home galaxy had been strip has stripped the species of their fourth sensitivity. The reason for this was because Zud of the Yurvong were becoming a violent race who craved war and brutality, which was led to their hatred and mechanical machines as they fought the opposing droids that invaded their galaxy. So the Urn Vong's original homeworld had seen fit to cut them off from the Force. This caused them to experience great pain as they lived in symbiosis with the original Yuzantar, rendering them unable to contact the Force or be detected in it ever again. This was among one of the reasons that the Vong had hold pain and death as such an essential part of their religion because when they were cut from the Force, they realized that the pain and death were the only forms of living symbiosis that they could achieve. Thus, the Un Vong had cemented this new way of life into their religion by creating gods who looked so positively upon these creatures, the, the, their creations, as those creations embrace what all living beings must suffer in life and more. And when you, when the use when the earth using bomb had devastated their own galaxy at, as a whole in the Kremlian War, way Kremlian War, they were forced to join into the intergalactic void in search of another galaxy for them to conquer and live in, thus leading to the eventual invasion of the galaxy. Meanwhile, Jason Solo experienced the return of the voice who told him to stand firm at Doro three years earlier, along with the vision of failing to catch the lightsaber tossed to him by his uncle Luke. From this, Jason begins to wonder if he will make the right decision in the near future against the Yuzen Vong. Now, it's later revealed that who's the voice that stands that tells him to stand firm is actually Luke Sky is Anakin Skywalker. So more and more Anakin Skywalker is trying to help out his family since, well, he feels like this is the best he can do since he's a spirit. But um we do learn more about the Yuzavong's backstory, and it shows how they were once a powerful race and how they were eventually destroyed by war and whatnot. And, well, look at what became of them now, and how they were stripped of their force during the war on, Yuzin Ta on the original Yuzantar. So, you kind of feel sorry for them because they have become so destructive and brutal, but at the same time, you're also saying, well, they killed 365 trillion people, so 
yeah, like, yeah, you probably still hate them. On the new Yuzentar, Nomenar is accepted back into species society by Supreme Lord Shimura, Shimura, who also promotes the former outcast to the rank of Prefect of, the, of Yuzentar. This promotion was influenced under the mistaken belief that Nomenar had killed Skedot, but unfortunately for him, he still has to bear the existence of the High pr Prefect Drahalu, who is secretly cor a Corellist, a member of the Forbidden Party who believes the Shimmer's late pre predecessor, Corellia, Corell, was killed dishonorably by the, by the current Supreme Lord, and the Corell was right about refusing to conquer the galaxy. Dahu Darth Rul is vaguely aware of Nomar's lack of faith in the Vong religion and Shimmer's competence and in Shinra's competence as the Supreme Overlord. So the High Prefect tries to use this as leverage in order to co coerce Nomenar into being a Corellist. And what is even worse for Nomenar's return to Vong society is that his own Jedi heresy, which he conducted as Yusha, prophet of the Shane Ones, continues to stand strong by the will of the Shane and worker castes, even without his leadership, thanks to his once trusted aide, the Shane warrior Kuna. This this is evident as the heretics break up the sacrifice of the Alliance captives, saving many, including Major Kraken, even at the cost of some of their own lives. And even when Shimura demanded the deaths, demanding the deaths of many heretics and potential heretics alike, the Jedi heresy still stands strong. All this, all this simply adds to the list of problems that Shimura and the rest of the Yuz, of Yuzentar are going through with the world brain still making unpleasant activities to disturb Yuzen Vong High Command in spite of Shimura's attempts to fame, frame, tame it. The rumors that the Supreme Overlord are going mad with power and that the loss to the Galactic Alliance is inevitable, and one of the few things guaranteeing uh, Shimura's position of power is his own royal guard of slayers, genetically modified warriors designed to not only protect him loyally, but also specialized to kill Jedi. They also pilot specialized ships seen by Han and Leia in the Silverian Kalu system, as well as being responsible for Fissin and Sasso's deaths and Team Maluk's capture on Kalu. So, let's see, the Galactic Alliance is having problems with money and foundation, and also Alpha Red, and the Yuzumonga are struggling to keep order themselves with the heretics, and all the other stuff. So, yeah, this is not looking good for either side, so this war is going to go either way at this point. Eventually, um, Skoda arrives to, in the Coruscant system, coinciding with Nomar's false prophecy to the heresy from the previous novel as it appears in Yuzintar Sky. This course is Nor Master Nas Kork to recall his armada from the from their winning battle against the Galactic Alliance on Monte Calamari to Yuzintar. It also distorts the mainstream social hierarchy of the species and causes great joy in the Shane Ones and workers for bringing their oppressive rulers down. Shimura even seems to go insane by this as no one else sees sees from the demands that the Supreme Lord makes to the highly placed officials at his command. This apparent insanity is further proven when Shimura, who believed the Yuzumon no longer need their gods, whether or not the deities actually existed, tells Nomar that he declares open war on you, on you know, the gods. Even though they were, it was likely that Shimra never really believed in the gods throughout the course of his reign. While he tells the rest of his elite that it's, that it's time to prove themselves independent from, from their gods, the Dread Lord explains himself by saving the god, that god, by saying that God feared that they will lose their own power over the use of Vong as the species gained their independence from their deities, pitting Zomara against the Vong and just one final test to see if the species is worthy of ruling the galaxy. And as Simura announces, the galactic invaders have already provided the means of killing the living planet thanks to the Alpha Red infected Slayer ship. Since Zomara's biology is closely related to the Yuzumong and their creations of own, and the creation's own biology, it can kill the living planet. Suspicions to Shimura's insanity further increases when he orders the deaths of all potential future Supreme Rulers meant to replace him when it was time for his reign to end and to put an end to the worshipping all gods but Yun Hunda in order to provoke anger from the other deities. As part of the declaration of open war, but despite their suspicion, these suspicions that these orders from the Dread Lord are successfully carried out as he also demands for the deaths of all the rioting heretics, which the warriors begin enacting loyally. Uh, meanwhile, as the Galactic Alliance loses its great Admiral 
Akbar from old age, it military its military passes through long defenses at the capture of planet of Korog after a vicious bat after a victorious battle. Making it possible for it to advance on using Tar. So now we're finally here. The epic battle. The conclusion to the New Jedi Order series. The battle that would decide the very fate of the galaxy itself. Will the Yuzen Monks finally destroy the Galactic Alliance? Or will the Galactic Alliance and the galaxy's other factions team up to, in order to destroy what's left of them? Let's find out. But first, um, I'd like to say that now the Yuzen Monks leader has lost his mind and is becoming Chancellor Palpatine. Soon, the Galactic Alliance forces arrive at Yuzentar, and Shimura telepathically orders the World Brain to destroy Yuzentar, so that if the Yuzentar lose the, against the Alliance, they will not have Coruscant to reclaim. As a result, no one are realizing the full extent of Shimura's insanity when the World Brain begins enacting this order, returns to his guides that you saw the Prophet, and sides with the heretics and their Alliance allies against Shimura's order. All these marks in the beginning of the recapture of Coruscant. Now we're here, the biggest battle in the Galactic War, and the Intergalactic War. And while the Galactic Alliance duels the wrong fleet in space on using Tar around Mus Cave, uh, and as almost get it, Han, Leia, and Hanar lead a mission aboard the Millennium Falcon to either convince the World Ranger to seize his efforts in trying to destroy using Tar or kill it. But they, they are then captured by the Yuzin Among forces led by Darth Rule. And Han, Leia, Hanar, C-3PO, R2-D2, Kakhmaim, and Milwath well, are taken by them in order to be executed at the well of the world brain as sacrifices to the creature. Meanwhile, Mar Jade and Talia, Talia Vila and Jedi Master Kith Hammer, ha Hamner fight alongside the heretics and their alliance allies against Shimura's forces, and Talia comes into contact with Nomar. She catches him, holds him for Mara to come over so that the latter can see it her way as to how he should be punished for all the wrong he has committed throughout the war. However, Nomar escapes Talia's grasp and flees, but Mara chases him down into an abandoned building. After a brief fighting between the two of them, Mara defeats and nearly kills him for giving her the Kuhn Spore years earlier, and for all the other misdeeds for which he had given to the Jedi in the late New Republic during this invasion. But the false prophet pleads for mercy, telling Mara that he had, cha that he had changed as Yushin Sha Yusha. He also knows that even if a species win the war, Coruscant would could never be used in Tar. Finally, killing no Mara would be an act of vengeance of the dark side of the Force, which would greatly break Mara's son Ben's heart. So even though Mara does not believe a word he said, she, she spares him for the others to decide his fate after the battle using Tar, assuming that the Galactic Alliance will win. So basically, hey, I'm gonna guilt trip her. Yeah, let's guilt trip her. And that kind of worked. Like, she spares him, but this is mostly to set him on trial. But at the same time, she knows maybe Ben probably wouldn't like this, obviously. He also tells us that Shimra has ordered the Alpha Red infected Vong ship transferred from Kalu to Zomoske as is set to killing the living planet. So the Jedi and heretics travel to the well of the will brain to save Han, Leia, and the others from being executed and subsequently warn the Galactic Alliance forces about the Alpha Red infected Vong ship heading to Skalat. Skid it. The latter situation is all for naught as the ship successfully evades the Alliance and Zomara's defensive forces to arrive at the Living Planet. Despite this, Dothru's forces are overwhelmed at the well of the Will Brain. If, even by backup traditional warriors who have seen the error of Shimura's ways, while the High Prefect himself is strangled to death by Nomenar, being that they were obvious personal enemies. Meanwhile, Luke and the Soul Twins, Jason and Jaina, set out to kill Simra and bring the war to its end with his death of the Galactic Alliance victory with the captured Judah Page and, and his Katarn commandos. Luke and the Soul Twins travel to the Dread, Lord, to the Dread Lord's Citadel via the Second pre Precept in order to assassinate the Supreme Overlord. Jason, thanks to his mental connection that he made with the World Brain, breaks Shimmer's own telepathic connection over the planet's controlled death room and convinces it to cease the, its destruction of using tar. This prevents Han, Leia, and Hanar from killing the World Brain. Han, Leia, and Hanar's hostage, Master Shaper, or the Quad, had told them that it would be impossible to sway the death room of Shimmer's command.
Jason also convinces the Yuzin von Bayots, Shagua, and Tushikart, who also nicknamed Biter and Beater, respectively, by the Vong, into helping him, his uncle, and his sister enter the Sindel, while Paige and Katarn, Katarn Commandos storm the lower levels of Shimmer Sindel. Luke and the Solo Twins battle their way through the Vong Warriors as they travel up the monk the mountainish world ship. During this time, Luke seemingly surrenders himself to his force, letting himself engulf, letting it engulf him so they can be in, he is an unstoppable force of nature which no Yuzin Vong can counter, which neither Jason nor Jaina can comprehend visually or through the force as their uncle or through the force as their uncle. So basically, Luke is trying to be Anakin Solo here. Like like like, I feel like it should have been Anakin Solo, Jaina, and Jason had Anakin Solo live. Like, this would have been the obvious setup, but you could check that out in a Destiny Altered, which I published on the Star by Star um, description box if you want to check that out by uh, by an origami fish. So, yeah, you could check it out there. Actually, Luke, Jason, and Jaina arrive at Shimmer's private coffer, which acts as an emergency evacuation ship for the Supreme Overlord at the top of the Citadel, and the Jedi proceed to kill the Dreadlord, but Shimura is joined with his Guard Slayers, and he sends them to duel Luke, Jason, and Jaina. Then the Citadel begins to sway and tip in all directions, making the Jedi think that the World Brain is doing this in order to help them combat the Slayers, but the battle becomes all more difficult for both parties because of the swaying and tipping is affecting both groups' performances against each other. In the end, though, the Slayers are all killed in combat against the three Jedis, despite the special using Mung Wars efforts thanks to their opponent's opponent's skills with their lightsabers, combat training in the Force. However, after apparently forcing his Citadel to stay put in his regular placement because of the mental connection he has with it, Shura knocks Jason unconscious when the latter tries to attack him, knocks away his lightsaber, and begins to suffocate Luke with a special staff, the Scepter of Power. Then the Supreme Overlord kill, uh, prepares to kill Luke by utilizing the ant lightsaber of the late Anakin Solo. The lightsaber was collected by the Yuzum Vong after Anakin died from the Star by Star two years earlier, in which was brought to Shimra after the late Ganner, Ganner used it against the Galactic Invaders prior to his own death around the same year. Disregarding the Vong's hatred of mechanical technology by harboring Anakin's lightsaber in order to show Luke how it feels to be fighting someone that is part of, or at least bears similarities to their society. Shimra reflects his species battle on Zumoskata, the living planet that they feel should be sacred to them, but was thrust into fighting fighting them by their enemies, and apparently their gods, even though the Vong sacred text state that attacking a galaxy with a living world in it is sacrilege anyway. So, yeah, the Yuzum Vong are breaking their... So you have the Supreme Lord breaking his own ideology of technology is bad and whatnot to use Anakin Solo's lightsaber against Luke, so... I'm curious to know what would have happened if the Supreme Lord had been captured... And the Vong found out he was trying to use technolo human te galactic technology and not biotechnology as as a tool, and I'm pretty sure he would be burned at the stake. Meanwhile, Gina follows the Supreme Lord Shane Familia Onimi into the control section of the coffer at the bottom bottom of the semi-staircase leading to the coffer's controls. The Familia knocks her unconscious via poison his fangs, and then mounts her in between st statues of two Vong deities on the vessel's bridge. Back with the confrontation between Luke and Shimura, Luke manages to reclaim Anakin's lightsaber from Shimura's gra grass, despite being poisoned by the Scepter of Power so he could cut the Scepter of Power into pieces with both his and his late nephew's lightsaber, preventing the Scepter of Power from cutting off his air supply any further. He uses both Jedi weapons to in his hands, to decapitate the Supreme Lord, the Jedi Master then collapses from the poison injected into his system by the Scepter, and then he throws Anakin's lightsaber to Jason, who woke up from being a, from be, from being knocked out, but Jason misses the lightsaber, reflecting that the vision returned to him on his own skid at falling to catch the weapon. Despite this, Jason is set flattering Luke to retrieve J by a faltering Luke to retrieve J Jaina. So, the vision has come to pass, yet we all know how this is going to end, but now the Supreme Overlord is dead, you feel like Anakin is there since his lightsaber is there, and you, feel, and you can make the argument, oh, maybe Anakin's still there in heart, but in spirit, but, like, it just doesn't feel the same. On the bridge of the Shadow's Coffer, Jaina wakes up to 
Onimi, who reveals that he was actually the real supreme ruler of the Yuzumong ever since Shimmer seemingly ruled the species. No, Onimi believes that the Jedi are the avatars of the Vong gods, and with Jaina being Yun Haru, the trickster goddess, which she used as a persona in the latter half of the invasion of psychological warfare against the Vong. This supports Onimi's motivation as he explains that he was once a shaper who used his brain with Yama tissue in order to gain knowledge for what he discovered to be an empty ape cortex in the shape of science. The air cortex was meant to find a way to save the Yuzumov from the decades of violence against the, each other as they crossed the intergalactic border in order to arrive in the galaxy. Only me and his goal of trying to find a way to save his people via Yonmoth's fusion to his brain became the shame, a shame one for this. He then blamed the gods, especially Yun Halu, for his afflictions and their motivation for retaliation against the Shaper who was trying to divulge the divine knowledge. However, Onimi found that he had regained the Yuzumong's lost connection to the Force, mistaking it for the power of the gods, however. He then used it to manipulate Shimmer's via mind control into invading the galaxy. Behind the scenes, as Shimmer's throne, Onimi was the one who really led his species into the invasion, as he previously confirmed, and he originally thought the, that the war was just a test by the gods assigned to him and his species in order to see if they were worthy of the worlds that the galaxy had provided. But as the war went on, Onimi later evaluated that the gods wanted to destroy him in his rule with Shimmer acting as his puppet, thus destroy the Yuzumong as a whole. He asserts that, on that the gods would not want such power to be stronger than they were if this was the reason that their creations were losing the war, especially with the living planet, planet Skedot are now among those bat battling the bomb. Since these events transpired, Onimi lost his mental hold over what was left to Shimmer's psyche because he had been preoccupied with defeating the Yuzumong's enemies, which was what brought upon the false supreme overlord's insanity as no one observed the final battle of the Yuzumong war began. It is also revealed by the surreal Supreme Overlord that he was responsible for swaying and tipping of the Citadels. Only, only me performed this by using mental connection that he had with it, which was obviously greater than Shinra's, in order to increase the chances that the Slayers had in winning the battle. Now, even with the presence of Skedot, Shimra's death in the fall of Yuzin Tar, Onimi believes that he will be able to become a god with Zomar's destruction via Alpha Red. He has now gone so insane that he plans to wipe out every single living being and thing in the galaxy. So now you get a coup d'etat, a uh, power behind the throne, and last but not least, insanity. So yeah, he's officially lost his mind. So before Shimmer's coffers launches under the only means command, the Jedi, the Yuzumong heretics, and their traditional Vong captives, and some of the Galactic Alliance soldiers and commandos are involved in the Battle of Yuzumtar arrive at the Citadel. As Captain Page and his commandos return to the surface to meet up with their allies, their mission in the lower levels of Shimmer's Citadel, successfully a division of the world ship's arriving party, investigates the upper levels of the Citadel. Where they find Shimmer's decapitated form and Luke dying, Mara then takes Luke aboard the Millennium Falcon for heal healing. Because, well, we knew Luke wasn't going to die because he's protected by George Lucas at this time. Uh, let's see, where was I? Um, while well, Hanard announces to the heretics that their traditional Vong allies and captives that Shimmer is dead, which announces joy to those who are against Shimmer, while well, those still loyal to the false Supreme Overlord are either in a state of surrender or disbelief. Meanwhile, no Arsh, who is shocked at Shimmer's demise, leads Han and Leia aboard the launching coffer in order to search for the Solo Twins. And then the evacuation ship launches as the vessel reaches the for space above Yusantar. Jason arrives on the ship's bridge and con confronts Onimi, who senses him in the divine glow of, of Yushau, the partner goddess, goddess of the Shane Ones, and the betrayer of everything that the real Supreme Lord has set out to create. Meanwhile, Warmaster no Nas. Kodak disbelieves the reports of Shimura's death, especially when he sees the coffer launch from the Houston Tower, making it, mistaking it for riding under the control of the false Supreme Overlord. After the voice that told him to stand firm returns to Jason one last time, having realized that it came to his late grandfather Anakin Skywalker, Jason launches into a fight against the Supreme Overlord, and the Jedi Knight who started out in the war as a doubtful hesitant manages to achieve oneness with the Force in order to fight without fighting, countering and throwing off Unimi's actions at every turn while making a single misstep or mistake in the combat himself. Fulfilling the request made by his grandfather, the, the Supreme Lord does his best to fight off his opponent with material prowess, the poisonous toxins which he used inside his own body in the forest but to no avail. Jane attempts to help Jason against Onimi, but the former communicates with her that the energy source that they share as Jedi to save her power in order to rep 
rupture herself from the Supreme Warrior's fang poison. Then Jason realized he could not catch the lightsaber in either vision or in real life because he is the lightsaber who will defeat only me. The true Supreme Warlord of these involved, the darkness of everything and that the invaders stand for. The Jedi Knight then becomes too powerful for his opponent to fight off, and then Jason uses the Force's pure energy to pure and only me to the bulkhead of the last back. As a result, Jason effectively defeats the one responsible for bringing the whole war in the galaxy in the first place. Sort Shortly after, no Han, Leia, and Nominar come aboard the bridge to see Jason's victory, and they find that he has seemingly aged by five years, erasing each chase of childhood, an event which, coupled with the backdrop of the stars and fighting space forces shown from the evacuation transport hard, burns into Leia's memory and will remain with her until the end of her life. Meanwhile, thanks to Jason's force energy fixing the supreme overlord of his shame deformities, Onimi has been shaped properly again, but because of his disfigurement were the results of individual gain of the force in the first place, the real loss of the deformities and the force also results in the loss of control over the poison of his own body. As a consequence, the, sup the true supreme overlord slides down again along the bulkhead behind him and dissolves into a pile of fluid hydraulics, hydraulic carbons. Only these liquid remnants are then sucked in by a Eurocoral deck of the, of the vessel like a stain, marking the end of the Supreme Overlord's true reign of the, on the Yuzen Vong. Following his death, the coffers start to die off because of the connection that they had with him, now severed thanks to his passing. The process... Um, the process of the vessel's own death as the Shimmer's capital explode, on Yuzentar explodes because of the same reason. Jaina picks up Jaina... I mean, Jason picks up Jaina up off the Vong statues, which only me put her in between, explaining that he refused to have help against the Supreme Lord so that she could use it to heal, her, heal herself, confirming what he had already told her through the Force. Then Norman R tries to kill the souls for the mystique that they have given him by nearly tricking them into going into a garbage chute, making them think there was an escape vessel known as the Yorotrima, but because of Jason's bong sense, he detects Jason Nolanar's treachery and prevents the death of his family and himself by providing the information to all those present. Nolanar desperately tries to one last attempt to escape them using his prowling bowl in order to shoot the poison out of Jason and use it as a device, disguised as a finger on his hand, to depart. But Jason uses a force technique taught to him by the late Vergen on rendering Nolanar's poison barren in terms of of its intended effects in order to transform it into water, thereby saving himself. At the same time, Leia stops Nomenar from escaping by quickly cutting off the hand which he tried to pull the device with her lightsaber, immobilizing him. After Jason tells him that he did not have to be this way, Nomenar proclaims that he did because he fit in neither with the natives of the Gal Galactic Society for his hatred of the Force or the use of for his uh, atheism. Regardless, he is offered by Han to escape with the dying evacuation ship when the souls enter the real ship and escape, but Noah R finds that since the Yuzumong have lost a war, he does not want to have any part of what is to come. He will then die with Noma and Anna as they were both alike, so he pushes Han on board the, the York Trema with, with the last family, then leaves himself aboard the dying evacuation vessel as it explodes above Yuzumong, displacing, near, near, displacing nearby Yuzumong's ship in its wake. This ends the life of Noma and Anna, the Vong agent responsible for approximately half of the war as the souls survive in the escape vessel, which is picked up by the Millennium Falcon piloted by Mara, which has a dying Luke aboard. Jason then uses his mother's tears and his own to heal Luke, and the Jedi Master quickly recovers from Shimmer's Ampistaff poison. The souls in the Skywalkers then reunite in a bittersweet embrace, while C-3PO and r 2 watch watcha on. With 3PO telling R2 that he envies over what joy humans must feel in times like these. In the wake of the destruction of, Supreme Coffer, of the Supreme Overlord Shimmer's Coffer, if Warmaster witnessing the event, he knew that then that the Supreme Overlord died with it, which is technically true since only me was the one really who had the Yuzumong into the war. Now for the first time in the history of the species, the Yuzumong are wow as Supreme Overlord. Seeing that they have lost under the elite that the species had lost Simra as the species conduit to their gods and their deities had turned against them. Kodak order all its forces to either surrender to the Galactic Lions, keep on fighting for their own stake, or commit suicide, officially hurling the end of the Yuzhen Vong War. As for the Alpha Red infected ship, Zoma Skeda managed to repel it before the vessel could arrive at the living planet. The rest of the Alpha Red is destroyed by the Galactic Lions, considering that it's no longer needed. The director of the Galactic Lions Intelligence Service for Dix Gafar for his actions in creating Alpha Red with the Chiss Ascensory 
is quietly forced to resign by the Alliance Chief of Staff, Cal Mass, and is replaced by Bill Belden Kaludu Kaludu. Scud also brought down all world ships in his immediate vicinity, both the Alliance and the Vong, was brought down to Zoma's Zoma's surface, getting rid of the invaders' weapons and halting the entire battle around it. And after the battle, Yus and Tar, the Peace Brigade is disbanded, and Chorak makes and Chorak makes a deal with the Galactic Alliance that the Scud Accords, the species will be spared in spite of the invasion that they caused, which has resulted in, like I said, 365 trillion native galactic deaths, and the bomb will be brought to no Zoma Skeda. During this time, Skeda realizes that it is the seat of the original Yuzin Tar, and taking on the form of Rungan, it shares this information to with Jason, Luke, and Hanar, which is something that the Yuzumon themselves will soon come to realize. After Cholak and his remaining obedient forces collect all the remaining Yuzumon forces across the galactic invasion corridor, for Zomara, especially with those who not heed his codex order to agree to, to the Skoda Accords, the Living Pan then takes the remaining youth Vong in the galaxy and travels into hyperspace. From this hyperspace jump, Skoda disappears back into the unknown region so that the Vong will be safe from vengeful galactic denizens, such as the Bothians who will, who have still have their their ritual declared against them. On the planet Zomona, by the intelligent Skeda, the one's violent species will learn the meaning of peace and regain their connection to the Force. Joining Zoma Skeda and the Vong are the likes of, the likes of, of Denaqui, Talek, and Talia Vila because Dava want, and Talek wants to study the living planet while Talia being her half of her, a used Vong herself because of her fusion with her own cod personality wants to help the species regain the force and become peaceful. The Galactic Alliance also automatically reclaims using Tara as course sign as part of their victory, rebuilding what the Vong have destroyed and keeping some of what they introduced to the planet for vanity reasons, including the World Brain, a sign of compromise that the Bothian Admiral Terrace Kifre appreciates. Though it would be unlikely that Coruscant could be properly habitable for the in any foreseeable amount of time, the citizens of the galaxy are optimistic. In the meantime, the Galactic Alliance relocates his capital to Dunna as Kor Coruscant heals thanks to the Galactic Alliance and help from the Vong Shapers that Zoma Skin didn't take off with. Amal Kerfei, meanwhile, is promoted as Supreme Cor Commander sorry, for his heroic efforts in, in rescuing Coruscant from the enemy's clutches, replacing Sin Sov. Luke announces... That coinciding with the war's end is the beginning of the Je New Jedi Order's belief of the unifying force, with com which combines both the light and dark side in perfect harmony. This belief also allows Jedi to embrace the idea that the best way to serve the galaxy is to act accordingly to their own consensus, and for all those who wish it, stay out of the affairs of the Galactic Alliance in the post-war galaxy. Jason, in the aftermath of achieving oneness with the force, in his fight against Onimi, decides to go off on a journey throughout the galaxy in order to study numerous beliefs and theories about the Force, train under them, and find out, what the, find out which Force belief will be the most appropriate for him to follow now that the war is over. Meanwhile, Imperial Ren and Grand Admiral Galen Palin, as a token of his gratitude to the Galactic Alliance for helping the Remnant fight back against the Izumong, gives Han and Leia the Alderaan Iranian mass moss painting, the Killer Twilight, which Han and Leia lost to Grand Admiral Throne 20 years earlier, which that the recently married Solos were on a mission on Tatooine. Cherishing it as one of the few remnants of a destroyed homeworld, Leia is especially thankful to Palin for giving her the, mem the memory. Jaina is forced to finish her relationship with JFL because of Jake's duties to uh, the Chiss and Jaina's duties to the rest of the galaxy, though Jake promises that whenever he can, he will visit Jaina as a Galactic Alliance ambassador of the Chiss Asen Asenjuri. The novel and the series finishes with many of his characters, including Jason before he leaves for his journey, going back to Kashyyyk in order to honor the late Chewbacca, who gave his life in Vector Prime so that Han and Anakin Solo, along with many other inhabitants of the planet gathered aboard the Millennium Falcon at the time, could live with, when the when the Vong, when the parrot, patron Vong, the specialist and treacherous advanced forces of the, of the extra, extra galactic invaders has destroyed the world. Han plans Anakin's lightsaber on Chewbacca's memorial so that if another threat like the Yuzu Vong were to arise in the galaxy ever again, as Luke announces, someone worthy of Chewbacca's honor and courage will take the weapon and conquer the potential menace. Which never happened. The characters then have a celebratory feast, finding humor and relief that, in fact, 
in the fact that once again, the galaxy is at peace. So that ends the New Jedi Order series with the Unifying Force. Let's go into the behind the scenes stuff. <laughs> The epic finale of the New Jedi Order reveals only Mii's true nature, an element that existed even in the initial storyline when the invaders were still described as Darksiders. They were to be led by a god, god king and his dwarvis adjutant. The adjutant's relationship with the king was described as symbolic, and in this early form, only Mii was Iago-like. He would be destroyed by Anakin Solo from the outline. It says this, Forced by Luke, by his dark side mentor, by his very ancestry as the grandson of Darth Vader, Anakin is the sort of righteousness. As the under outline underwent revision with George Lucas's feedback and Anakin was replaced by Jason, Jason's defeat of Onimi became more specific. Vernon had been identified as someone who could use the Force at a molecular level, as evidenced by, his, by her healing te tears. Jason learns this ability and applies a version of it with, when he destroys Onimi from the revised outline. And this is when Jason uses what he has learned. He connects to with the Living Force to analyze the attack of a cellular level on a cellular level and then turn turn it turn it back on its attacker and the minute mission and the men and the minion is consumed horribly. The final book retains some of this cellular transmission transmutation as Jason uses the force to neutralize toxins secreted by Onimi, but layers of it with with the metaphysical transformation of Jason becomes a conduit to the force. The original description of Vergens as as a kid like Jedi resonates in this passage, as Jason essentially uses Onimi's power against him. The unifying force also sheds more light on the history of the use in Vong, a fleeing mention of a technologically foe deeply imprinting a hate a hatred of technological technology among the ancient Vong were expanded upon, was expanded upon in the new essential guide to droids in two thousand six, which connects the Celerian Soundtium, the enormous mechanical beings at the end of the Lando Calrissian Adventures in 1983 to the backstory of the New Jedi Order. The hardcover novel came pa cat packaged with a CD-ROM of the supplemental materials including including the full text of Vector Prime as an ebook. A round robin interview where members of, of the New Jedi Order development team a description of the use among from the series planning documents and selects tr illustrations of relevant starships from the New Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels, and in 2003, and the paperback edition of the use in, of the of the Unifying Force, including the round robin round robin interview. So that was the behind the scenes stuff, and they also go on to mention that Anakin Solo was supposed to be the hero of the story and how he was supposed to save the galaxy, but it went to Jason Solo. Now. There's, there's a reason why I like this the second best. This is also the second longest novel in Star Wars history. But there's a reason why I say this is the second best. It's because, have you ever had that feeling where if they stopped here as a whole, as a story, then you probably wouldn't complain? That's what I got when I read, when I looked up on Unifying Force. Like, I felt like if Star Wars stopped here, I would not complain. Like, I probably would complain if I was younger, but since I was a huge Star Wars geek, Star Wars fan, but, like, now that I'm older and whatnot and understand things, if they stopped it here, I would have said, awesome. That's how you end a story. Like, like how do you, like, like, afterwards, it's hard to tell how do you continue where you left off. Like, the galaxy got united against the Yuzen Vong, what, be a Mass Effect 3 style. They finished a battle on the planet that basically was the center of attention. And they also pretty much revealed that the Imperial Remnant is grateful and probably is part of the Galactic Alliance to an extent as an ally. So, I'm like, the only problem here is that, well, there's no Sith. So, you can't really, there, not a lot of Sith appeared in this, not any Sith appeared in it. I'm like, Dark Jedi appeared in here, but... Sith didn't. If Sith has show, if the Sith have showed up in this story, um, and they were united with the Jedi, then then you could say, yeah, the story would end here. They did have all these subplots left over that would build up to other stories that taking place after New Jedi Order. Then I would have said this could actually be a perfect place to actually stop at. Like this was actually a very great story. Like we got, we learned about a species. We documented an entire war that lasted for several years. We've seen characters that we love die. And you also feel like there's a bittersweet moment when they're doing the celebratory feast. 
when the family has a Salvatore, when the Skywalker Solo clan have have a feast, um, you just have that feeling like someone's missing because Anakin Solo isn't there. You just say, yeah, he, like it's bittersweet because you wish he was here, but he isn't, and that's the reality of war. So, uh, everyone, those were my thoughts on the whole New Jedi Order series and the Unifying Force. This was Neo Reality Entertainment. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and donate to tune for more.